you. This was a lovely uh, introduction. And um, it, the last academic talk I attended uh, pre-pandemic was a Zuby lecture, Jonathan Wynn's talk. And this is my first post-pandemic or during pandemic, like first in-person academic talk. Uh, so it's, it feels really nice and I hope this is a good omen, uh, both for the pandemic and for our collective health and also for this project. Um, so um, I'm gonna have these notes because um, as Camille um, said, this is the first time I'm presenting this work even though I've been working on smart cities for a very long time. And I will talk about that, but the portion of this work is new. And I'm really excited to share it with this community because um, I will talk about urban data analytics and I know that you guys are using analytics or some kind of data platform uh, either in teaching or in education or when you start work you will have to grapple with those tools on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm really curious to hear your feedback on what I've found, uh, in what ways that you know, my findings resonate with you and, and whatever questions you have about the project will do actually like also help me. So please bring all your feedback uh, either during or at the end of the talk. Feel free to interrupt me. I'm, I'm not distracted by that kind of uh, disruptions. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start by taking you to a co-working space in Kansas City, Missouri. In the fall of 2017, I was a participant observer at um, a smart city tech summit organized by a local tech community. I think the photo is a little dark, apologies for that. It's also partly because I was trying to secretly take a picture. Um, um, the city at the time the, was going through a smart city uh, transition and the local tech organizers, like entrepreneurs as well as like residents who are interested in um, data analysis organized this tech summit to invite local area companies to come in and talk about like what they can do for the city with data. Uh, but they also invited public officials from cities both like Kansas City but also Chicago, Birmingham, St. Louis, um, Charlotte, um, just to kind of like bring people together to share best practices. Um, during one of the sessions, the CEO of a local uh, data analytics company, whom I will call Michael, began by saying, I assume we're all in this room because we want to answer the question of how we become a smart city. And he quickly, and I should add loudly, followed. It is a lot of work. Most heads in the room like nodded along, like agreeing with Michael that it is a lot of work. And then he continued dividing cities into two groups, ones that have real pain points, real problems, and they need data to better understand what they're gonna do to address those issues. And then that those that launch smart technologies and hope, and I quote, somebody's going to come and figure out what to do with this data. In response, literally everyone in the room started laughing. And Michael followed again, we spend a lot of time and beers, he playfully said, to figure out what to do with data. So I start with this scene because my talk today will focus on the kind of work that people like Michael do and the companies like um, people like Michael lead uh, that help municipalities turn urban environments into smart cities, digital cities, data-driven cities, you name it. I'm not that sort of uh, committed to the label, but cities that are invested in using digital technologies to, for planning, for policy making. Um, I'm going to use the term smart city for a while just for the sake of simplicity and as you might have known for the last decade many municipalities in the US and across the world have like jumped on this bandwagon to become a data driven city. Municipalities are very eager to overlay urban environments with sensors, cameras, uh, digital kiosks to constantly collect information and figure out a way to use that information um, in day-to-day decision-making. From housing development to transportation planning to um, sort of figuring out like how to organize the parking spaces in the city. 
And the smart city market is big and diverse, and I would also say like diffuse. There are the big sort of usual suspects like Cisco, IBM, Alphabet, the parent company of Google. But then there are a lot of small to mid-sized companies or startups that sort of specialize in selling hardware and software to municipalities uh, in the name of data-driven solutions. Planners are obviously one of the main target clients of these companies. They really want to be able to capture you folks. Um, and most of the time, these technologies are works in progress. Like they are in some kind of beta form. Um, they are, you know, rolled out and then require a lot of feedback from the users to be fine-tuned and improved over time. Um, and cities need sort of these companies to work with, not only because they want to make sense of the data that they are collecting, but also they want to look like they're data driven, right? Like there's like a branding component to it too. Uh, so most of the time the city staff may not always be proficient in data science or understanding what these technologies are doing and they kind of rely on these companies to make sense of the tools that they are using. So as one uh, public official put it in an interview, there is this expectation that municipalities know what smart cities means but it really means many things to many people. Uh, but by focusing on the work of urban data analytics companies, um, I plan to show you that becoming or quantifying a smart city uh, is not just a formal process of crunching numbers. Um, a colleague of mine, media scholar Shannon Mattern, puts it really beautifully. She suggests that a city is not and cannot be a computer, right? Like it's such a, a city is like such a complex environment that it can never be reduced to just data. But I want to like take it a step further and say that even the attempts to computerize the city, even the parts of the city that we think are being quantified, even then it's not a formal, rational process. As, a, as I suggest in the title of the talk, most of the time that quantification work is less science and more art. It's intuitive, it's subjective, it's driven by relationships. Um, and it's not like a municipal agency procures some kind of software and dashboard and then boom, everything is very straightforwardly sort of rationalized or quantified. There's a lot going on in the background that I wanna like sort of highlight in this talk and show you that it's not as straightforward as um, I think some uh, urban data scientists uh, want us to think. So instead, I argue that computational technologies in urban settings are co-constructed by the politics and practices of institutions. So these technologies are shaping these environments, but the environments shape these technologies as well. And despite the rise of urban data science, which I'm aware is a big deal in the fields of planning and public policy, I propose to focus on the art side, um, both to demystify this sort of deception of seemingly uh, independent objective quantifications uh, and to better examine the power dynamics embedded in the construction and use of these technological systems um, and their use in local policy making. I'm obviously not the first person to make these claims. This is my uh, sort of lit review section, but it's also, you know, for those of you who are interested in exploring smart cities a little bit more, maybe this slide can like guide you toward the literature, uh, the, the good books that I think uh, are out there that examine uh, what I would consider the socio-political landscape of smart cities. It's a very rich and interdisciplinary uh, literature from geography to planning to media studies to sociology. Uh, so I really highly recommend these and more if anyone's interested in uh, further exploring. Most of these books uh, or studies criticize smart cities uh, for being these like techno-political projects that are neoliberal, that are top-down, um, police state embodying surveillance systems. Um, critics also point to the hype of the smart city that elevates innovation above all else. Um, 
and the way that I think they also do a really good job of highlighting the ways that these technologies intersect with the existing uh, urban inequalities, class, race, um, you know, sort of spatial divides in the city that already exist. Um, and I agree with all these critiques. They're very important, they're very valuable. I agree with all of them. But I want to also provoke a little and suggest that not the critiques themselves, but the way that they are being repeated and recycled sometimes in public discussion um, could create binaries that don't always neatly converge with what's happening on the ground. So for example, um, we, when we think about the smart city, we think about the hype, the innovation, the shiny technologies, and then pit those against maintenance and care, um, sort of more like everyday boring technologies, mundane bureaucratic processes that also need attention. Um, we focus on the top-down approach that come from municipalities and tech companies and then pit that against the sort of equity-centered, bottom-up civic action. But what I find in my own research is that there is a lot going on beyond those binaries and in that sort of messy gray space that really need our attention. And that needs our attention, that messy space needs our attention, not because we're academics and we want to make everything more complicated, but also because that's where a lot of smart city action is happening. The, the kinds of companies that I'm going to talk about are not those big top-down companies that go after innovation. The companies that I will talk about are those that try to make those bureaucratic processes more efficient, more effective, but during that process also reproduce a lot of inequalities. So I want us to like look at that messy gray space and the work that these intermediary urban data analytics companies are doing to better understand the reach of uh, what I would call American techno-capitalism and how it can, you know, not always in those spectacular ways, but also in sometimes like sort of more quiet, mundane ways that it can be incorporated into um, local policy making. So a very quick background on who is this person and why is she qualified to talk about smart cities. Uh, I've been working on the question of smart cities since 2015. Um, as I opened my talk, I spent uh, some time in Kansas City when the city was going through its own transition to become smart. Um, between 2015 and 2018, Kansas City, Missouri partnered with Cisco, um, Google, Sprint, a telecom company, and a, a range of local uh, data analytics companies to uh, pilot a smart city program in the downtown area. Um, I was able to observe this transition from the very beginning. I lived in Kansas City for like a little more than two years. Um, so how, they, how the municipality and these companies designed the smart city, what they imagined. I was able to observe how they implemented it. And then um, the project was quietly ended in early 2019. So I was also able to see how it kind of failed, even though um, none of my interlocutors would agree with that failure characterization. Um, so during that research, I did a lot of um, observation and inter interviews uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about this part, the Kansas City part, which is my book project, but I'm more than happy to get into the details in the Q&A if anyone's interested in an ethnography of it. What I'm going to talk about mostly today is based on interviews I've been conducting since early 2020, actually. So most of these, I mean, all of these interviews were conducted over Zoom uh, because of the pandemic with founders and data analysts at these mid-size or small startup fee data analytics companies. Um, throughout these interviews, I asked them a lot of questions about what they do, but I also did this um, thing called code walkthroughs, which I'm also happy to elaborate on later, where um, these data analysts were walking me through uh, the software that they build. Uh, and, and I, as the non-technical person, asked a lot of what I called dumb questions, which always uh, elicited a lot of interesting insights, like why did you do this, why did you do that, why did you write the, 
you know, the designed architecture of this uh, software this way or that way. Um, so the talk today will focus on those interviews and, um, and the work that these companies are doing. And you might be familiar with some of them, companies like Remix, Civic Insight, um, Ptolemy is another one. I'm, I may be mispronouncing that one. These are, um, as I said, mid, small to mid-sized startups that specialize in urban data science. Um, some of them are very niche. They only focus on like one thing like curb management, which I thought was a ridiculous thing, but Camille nicely warned me that it is actually incredibly important. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for that correction. Um, so they specialize in you know, curb management or property code enforcement. Or they do like kind of a little bit of everything, touching on transportation, housing, um, most recently public health uh, data. Um, since I'm primarily relying on interview data, bear in mind that like I'll be reporting the way that these companies describe what they do and narrate how they work with. So I wasn't able to um, observe them in action. Uh, even though that's what I mostly do, but because of the pandemic, I couldn't do it. So there will be sort of, so we'll, we'll be hearing about their version of the story, but if you have any feedback on how that sort of operates in action, I'm you know, really curious to hear about that. So in the rest of the talk, I will talk about um, three lesser known components of this art that I mentioned, how these companies build relationships with local governments, and then towards the end, I will get into the implications of these um, relationships. So to me, one of the first surprising, somewhat surprising facts about these companies was that they were very clear not to describe themselves as a smart city company. Um, they, some of them use the term uh, GovTech, government technologies, or civic tech sometimes, even though that means something entirely different. But beyond the labels, I think it is very safe to say that when I asked these companies what they were doing, they always described their work uh, oriented towards sort of bettering, improving local government services. Many of the founders or the staff members of these firms have a background in civic data communities like Code for America uh, gatherings or they went to a planning or public policy school and then they got, they got excited about data science and got into these startups. Or very few of them also had some background in community organizing and then picked up some data science skills and found themselves at one of these startups. Um, but often when they wanted to describe their mission or purpose, they said things along the lines of like, I want people in, um, who work in city government to have the tools they need to do their job effectively. Um, one of them said, I don't think having more cameras in the world will make government more effective, but good software can help public officials do their jobs much better. Another founder drew um, a more direct contrast to smart cities and said, Rather than a grand centralized experience like smart cities, our company represents a more organic approach to modernizing cities at the service level. One CEO of a data analytics company called smart cities a bit like magical thinking um, and ahead of where the market was ready to be, but instead he suggested what they were doing was um, easy and much needed by public agencies. These smaller firms' efforts to distinguish themselves from the smart city narrative has a lot to do with the work that I think we've been doing in academia as well as in you know, community organizing. Uh, they really want to position themselves against that sort of um, top-down approach that I think bigger tech companies have been following um, to build those smart pilots in cities and the sort of overly hyped promises, right? Like they constantly try to um, dial down the expectations from their products even though they similarly use computational technologies. Um, instead, while these companies are obviously profit driven, they try to peddle a more civic oriented um, approach in their collaboration with 
uh, municipal agency is. Um, and this distinction they draw um, sort of in contrast to bigger tech companies also helps these startups to position themselves as brokers or consultants to municipalities, right? Like so they can be on the side of the municipal agency rather than on the sort of market side. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because if you are in the smart city territory, one of the things that you notice immediately is that for bigger tech companies, what matters is not necessarily the technology itself, but data collection. Like just this automated, ubiquitous data collection when most of the time it's not even clear to what end these companies are collecting these data. And it's okay for the industry, right? Like they're sort of, it's easier for them to say, let's just collect it and we'll invent a use case for this later. That's fine. And that's pretty much the venture capital startup model in Silicon Valley these days. Like they can figure out the use cases as long as they are able to uh, roll out their technologies in urban environments and collect the data. Uh, municipalities, obviously, even though they want to look like they are data driven or, and um, they are sort of like upgrading their uh, infrastructures with these like shiny new technologies, they still have to justify what that data that they're collecting is useful for, right? Like what is, what is the use case for this shiny new tools that you've just procured at the such and such agency? Like show us what you do with that. And that's when data analytics companies enter as the data science experts with their sort of low stakes, low key dashboard or software or analytics tool. And they can really help these local agencies to make sense of the you know, new transportation data that they've been collecting or the new sort of um, sensor data that is being streamed on their screens, but they're just looking at it and have no idea what to do with. Um, so, so that's one side of what I call instrumentalizing the critiques of the smart city. Another part of it is also the fact that because these companies are not positioning themselves from the perspective of innovation, they can also really speak the government speak in terms of mentioning the importance of climate resilience, transportation, equity. Like whenever I talked with the founders of these companies, they were saying things like, as long as cities care about these three things, and they will have to care about these three things for a very long time, uh, they will need data. And that's where we come in. What we bring to the table is not our technologies, but our knowledge about these important pillars of local policy making, which is a huge distinction between what like Cisco's, IBM's, and Google's are offering versus what these uh, firms are trying to do. So second um, component of the relationship building that these companies are doing is what I call taking inventory of data assets. So using critiques of the smart city to distinguish their work is not just a rhetorical move for these companies. It's also reflected in how they work with public agencies. So rather than trying to sell just a dashboard or a prototypical like smart technology, most of these firms actually start from trying to build uh, data relationships with cities. Um, and a significant part of their work really involves building data sets. And let me just sort of explain what I mean by data assets. So whether it's the trial period of a software or a city reaches out to one of these companies and says, hey, we have this like sort of problem with property code enforcement. Like, can your tool kind of help us make sense of this? Um, the first thing these companies do is not to address that problem, but to come in and say, what kind of data sets do you have? Like, bring me all the data that you have about this issue. And let me just look at the whole thing first. They all have a product. I put a picture here uh, of one of them. Like Building Blocks is one product of one company, but every one of companies I've like interviewed had a version of this. Um, it could be a software, it could be a dashboard, it could be like just a map-based visualization tool. But what what it does is, as I, I think you can't read it, but it's 
It connects and updates data held in different systems and formats across departments and agencies. So it's basically like a data warehouse where it pulls from different sources and brings everything together. Um, every company has a version of this, but with then each one of them have a different like proprietary like modeling or visualization tool. But this process of coming into the city and putting together all their data sets um, is like a whole, you know, month long, two months, three months long process based on the city because it involves not just their sort of soft data, but also things that exist in files like paper logs, uh, things that are sort of like forgotten uh, in some corner of a municipal agency. Um, it also includes sort of using the city's existing physical infrastructure, using the city's existing staff to figure out what else can be digitized, what else can be datafied. This is a very long code and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but as I highlight, uh, and this is like, a version of this came up in every interview. The first thing we'll do is we'll set them up and look at the data that they already have. And then they try to connect that data to other things that the company has because they are pulling this type of, like if it's property or transportation, they have similar data from other cities, right? So they try to pull them together to see what the, the current city is doing um, similarly or differently. And then they get into what else do you have? Do you know where your metered parking is? Do you have a map of your parking rates? Do you have a residential permit parking program? Do you have a list of your parking signs? Like anything can be digitized. Anything can become a source of data. Um, and once they sort of figure out all of those, then they start asking questions like, what else is missing? What else can we do for you? So this inventory, inventory building of data sets, tracking properties, wading through the history of regulations, these are often framed as maintenance work, not innovation, right? Like this is really just kind of grunt work that bureaucrats have to do, but these companies come in and try to sort of make it easier for them. Um, most of these firms describe the bulk of their job as maintaining, cleaning, reorganizing super messy data sets. Uh, as one founder put it, we build the tools into our front end to make it easy for city officials to find data, but on the back end, we're sort of doing all this frenzied work of data aggregation and cleaning. So during this cleaning and aggregation process, there's also an educational component where these bureaucrats are coming in and trying to teach city staff how to think from a data science perspective, so they organize hackathons, digital challenges where they sit together and try to figure out like how they can use data sets more creatively. Um, obviously they also want these cities to get more comfortable with using their algorithmic predictive tools because if you can imagine for many city officials just that aggregation and cleaning work is more than enough. Uh, but for these companies, they really want to test their predictive analytics tools, so they try to sort of coax these city staff members into playing with those data, uh, with those extra tools more actively. As one founder explained, uh, they try to be more than just a software company and become that nexus point for training best practices among local governments. Um, and through these educational activities, Similar to bigger companies, there is this push toward let's generate more data, right? So every, again, every one of those companies, in addition to those dashboards and softwares, they have an app uh, that they circulate among the city staff, for, especially for folks who do on-the-ground work to whenever they do visit a parking site or um, like a housing development they can just go ahead and uh, update the information on the app so that the larger system is well maintained and updated regularly. So the idea here is to really sort of position these companies as ones who are kind of like the data stewards, right? Like they kind of take care of the city's data sets. 
but also add value to them. Uh, and again, goes back to the same, like positioning themselves next to public agencies and do less hyped and more care-related work. Um, the final sort of component of this relationship building is what I call exploiting information asymmetries. So these companies do a lot of sort of what I would co consider cultural political work by, you know, cr critiquing smart cities and positioning themselves as alternatives. They do a lot of organizational work in terms of like cleaning those messy data sets and creating beautiful like streamlined processes. But they also take it even further and go out and bring data that the city doesn't have. And, that, and that's really sort of one of their premium services um, to municipalities. So as one um, founder told me, uh, what we're trying to do is not just be an aggregator. We're aggregating, okay, but we're also enriching. And by which he meant uh, running models on the data, doing projections, but also compiling different data sets and making sure that whatever they're bringing from outside of the city is apples to apples, right? Like, so it's, it, it can be compared. Uh, knitting together was a term that came up pretty often in my interviews. So, um, you know, bringing sociodemographic data from federal sources or from community surveys, which is something that we're very familiar with in academia, but, you know, municipal uh, officials may not always immediately be proficient or have access to them. Um, or, like, something more specific, like um, court eviction records, um, as you can see in this code. Um, so, one founder said, you would think that in a city that's dealing with an epidemic of evictions, housing courts would share that data with uh, local governments, with the mayor, but they don't. But that data is accessible to outsiders. It's, you know, public data. Uh, so the company can go ahead and scrape it and, um, and then give it back to the local government. Uh, this is something that, again, you might assume is, you know, a public official could do, but given the fact that there are not enough staff members, there's not enough time, there are not enough resources. So scraping court records on eviction filings and pre-foreclosure notices, or digitizing historic redlining maps uh, become an additional value for these companies that they bring to the table. Um, and they, you know, they become this sort of digitizer or data fire of these uh, sources that are already out there but are not sort of incorporated into that warehouse yet. As I said, another example is important federal or community data sets uh, because most governments lack granular information about the demographic composition of neighborhoods. Um, and again, going back to the sort of push towards equity, um, I think many cities want to be able to overlay whatever data that they have with uh, granular, you know, race, ethnicity, class, um, you know, educational data, and they just truly don't know how to do it or they don't have the time or resources, so they outsource that important work to these companies. But it's not just taxpayer-funded data uh, that these companies provide. Uh, they also have partnerships with third-party data providers um, based, you know, based on either personal data or population level data or, I don't know, like mobile tracking data uh, that may be useful actually in transportation a lot. And they can provide those uh, extra services for an additional fee. So I'm going to read you um, this fascinating description in one of my interviews, quote, if a city is willing to pay for property sales data, we flip the switch and turn that feature on quickly. If you can't get pre-foreclosure data, we can provide that for you. If you want vacancy data from the U.S. Postal Service, we can turn that on and bring that added value to our local governments for that extra fee. Uh, end of quote. What these firms end up doing then is uh, what I call exploiting information asymmetries that exist both in the decentralized federated political system um, and also, you know, this sort of p 
push to bring more outside private data into uh, what you know, policy makers call evidence-based decision making. Uh, most public agencies cannot easily overcome the small or big P politics of information sharing or as I've already mentioned, they don't have the resources both either to hire staff or to purchase these uh, data sets. So this work ends up becoming um, outsourced to these companies. So I talked about instrumentalizing the critiques of the smart city. I talked about taking inventory of uh, data assets. And then I talked about exploiting information asymmetry. So these are the sort of what I call the three components of the art of quantifying a smart city. But what happens alongside these uh, changes is also a new market. Um, throughout this process, these companies are also creating a separate market of data in which they sell the public data that they gather from these cities to private companies. So parts of the city that have not yet been digitized or datafied become a new site of market making in the sense that, okay, from one perspective, the clients of these companies is public agencies, right? Like they need all these added values and stuff. But then once these companies have all the data from all these different cities, then they go after private companies. So for example, if they have an expertise in property data, big real estate companies are really interested in that information that they have at a very granular level, city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood, over time. If it's about curb management, fleet companies, are very excited about to like get their hands on that data. And founders of these companies are very explicit about this. Like there's nothing sinister uh, from their perspective. Like that's fair game. Um, as one founder explained, once we're managing data for lots of different cities, we can be the data platform that the private sector uses to access this data. And this has always been one of our major goals. He, also suggested that this is something that really aligns the interests of everyone together in terms of um, how every city wants people to better understand what's happening um, on the streets. But obviously, as you can imagine, this is not a matter of knowledge sharing for these companies. It is about the significant monetary value that these right now publicly available data um, can be sort of become, can become um, a value, a real value for these uh, private companies. Sociologists Marion Foucault and Jeff Gordon call this process a private appropriation of public data that we know that it's already existing, but I think um, urban data analytics companies like bring a very new layer to that, right? Like they are constantly doing this brokering work among different cities, collecting all this information, adding their secret sauce of modeling, which actually really is not even used by public agencies, but the real value that is being generated is sort of being able to sell this public data to private companies and sort of become the key broker between um, the tech industry and, or not the tech industry, the larger industry, whatever they are like sort of um, dabbling in and, and the local governments. Um, technically, they're really sort of explicit about this, as I said, and as far as I understand, there's not much pushback coming from local governments. Um, they are, um, one of the things when we were discussing kind of code walkthroughs, one of the things that they kept talking about was how they were trying to push cities to, toward like more a universal taxonomy, because as you can imagine, every city uses very different ways of cataloging um, properties, you know, planning. Um, they have very different like languages, names, labels. And it's really hard for these companies to kind of have a software that is customizable for each city. It's also, I mean, it's hard technically, but it's also not preferable from an economic perspective. They want to bring everyone on the same page so that the data that they sell is apples to apples for the private companies. So there is this like whole push um, to bring everyone on the same page on a very technical level. 
uh, as well. Okay, so I'm going to sum up. Um, so what I, the story I'm trying to tell is that urban data analytics companies play this really key role of an intermediary uh, for municipalities that want to be data driven, which again, I'm, as I said in the beginning, I'm very critical of all of this, but I also recognize the practical value of bringing uh, data science into the everyday life of a planner, a policymaker, someone in, the, in city hall that is trying to push a particular policy backed by like, you know, hard evidence. So I, please don't um, think that I'm undermining the importance of becoming a data-driven city. But these companies are not just set, like simple like sort of vendors. They are consultants, they are data science experts, but they're also extractors of um, you know, value from municipalities, from cities. And they're very strategic about the way that they position themselves as I walked you through the way that they use smart city critiques, how they sort of use the language of equity, climate resilience, um, sort of transportation driven cities in order to speak to their um, target groups, right? Like they're very strategic about the process. Uh, they're also really strategic about their purposes, right? Like they're not over promising anything. They just want to streamline bureaucratic processes. They're interested in maintenance. They're interested in caring for the city. They're interested in the mundane, not the innovative. Um, and then they're also very good at exploiting the asymmetries that exist uh, between local and state governments, between local, state, and federal, um, you know, data sets, between governments and private sector data. And all of this happens alongside a constant commodification of public data that are already out there, uh, but we don't have the infrastructure to make them accessible and usable in the way that these companies are kind of pushing for. So in, so in that sense, they end up sort of not only acquiring, but also repackaging, reselling, uh, re-digitizing all this data, and then make it available for private companies. Uh, if there's one thing I would like people in this room to remember from this talk is to sort of see the complicated picture behind the software that you might end up using on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like it's not just a tool of better visualization or an easy way to sort of locate information. But there's a lot of um, political economy and organizational rearranging going on in the backstage. And as I try to demonstrate the quantification process uh, that is going through all this is not just science and is not only about mathematical skills, uh, but it's also art and artful in uh, its deception that it is formal and computational when in reality it is relational, it's social, and laden with uh, power dynamics. So I'll end it here and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.